Uh, well, kia ora everybody. My name is Virginia Nichols. I'm Chief Executive here at the Otago Southland Employers Association. It is wonderful to have you here and tēnā koutou katoa. Um, welcome very much to our briefing. This is a joint briefing with both ourselves and the Otago Chamber, which is pretty exciting, I think, for all of us. But first of all, I just need to do a health and safety briefing. So if we do need to leave, uh, we can either go out that way there or the way that we came in, so it should be pretty fine. So this for us is the last briefing. We've just done seven briefings, or once we've done this one it'll be seven. We started in Invercargill on Monday, we've been across to Queenstown, we went to Wanaka, uh, Cromwell, Alexandra and Omaru. And why did we do all of that? We've got members obviously all over the region, but because this is such an important briefing for the changes and things that are coming uh, for our members and for business in general. So before we begin, you'll just see on your chair, you've got a, a, a brochure here. I just want to mention a couple of things. We've got the Climate Change Commission coming down here, both to Dunedin and Invercargill. This is a very, very important consultation. This, uh, the recommendations here are about getting to carbon zero by 2050. And there is a plan there, or a proposed plan, that they're consulting on for six weeks. And please have your say, because it affects every single business with what they are planning. And there are many, many ways to do it, and I know they would very much appreciate any feedback. So we've got it here at our premise here in Dunedin. Also, too, we've just got to save the date for the Health and Safety Forum as well. Again, that's both in Dunedin and in Invercargill. We've also got Mike Burrell coming as well. Mike is the Executive Director of the Sustainable Business Council from Business New Zealand, and he's going to be here in March. So I'll put that out in the newsletter anyway. So we've got two speakers today. We've got David Brown, our senior solicitor, and also our legal team manager. And we've also got Paul Mackay, who's the manager employment relations policy at Business New Zealand. And as most of you know, when you belong to us, you also belong to Business New Zealand. They're our advocacy arm based in Wellington. They have all the discussions with the ministers. They have discussions with all of the officials. And they do the submissions for us back to Wellington as well of various different issues. And so Paul is going to be speaking on all of that. Um, we also, as you can imagine, uh, do various other interactions with MPs as well. So I'm just going to introduce David. David earned his law degree from the University of Otago, as to say, the best university in New Zealand, and entered the legal profession with a background in education, publishing and the arts. He was initially in private practice. He joined our legal team in 2014, and he's been with us now for seven years. He hails originally from the state of Virginia in the US, and he's going to talk a little bit about that as well, with just what's happening over there. And he's very much pleased now to call Aotearoa his home. He volunteers his time with two community organisations. So I'm just going to pass on to David. All right, so you need to understand I'm passionate about employment law. I love my job. I couldn't do it without you people. And you people deserve so much more credit than you've been getting. And if you haven't heard it anywhere else, thank you. Okay, let's get started. What is this? Anybody recognize this beautiful piece of New Zealand landscape? Okay, the Nevis Road. And I've used this photograph as a symbol of perhaps the road we're on in 2021. But if you know that road, what's just in those hills up there? Two dozen Fords you have to cross. So while we're on a pleasant road at this point, things seem to be under control. We don't know what's just up ahead. Okay, how about that? That's Will. Thank you, Will, for keeping me honest. First up, you know the drill. As Virginia said, I'm from the state of Virginia on the east coast of the U.S. My parents still live there. Their drill is ordering groceries online, having them delivered to the house. They take them into the garage. They wash them off dry them before they bring them into the house for use. It's a different environment, they're all together. What I intend to do this afternoon is touch on trends that we're seeing in the legal team, the matters that are coming across our desk. I wanna talk about Equal Pay, Pay, Pay Pair Act uh, will be touched on by, by Paul. 
I'm going to talk about holidays briefly and the bill to introduce 10 more uh, sick leave of 10 days. I want to talk about privacy that's been updated. It's the first update to privacy law in 27 years. And I also will talk briefly about COVID-19 support that is still ongoing for you guys and talk briefly about some important cases. There's a huge appetite for personal grievances. This is the email response you get from the Employment Mediation Service when you request mediation support. It is in red, and I'm pretty sure that's the color of the Labor Party red. That's a joke, folks. So what does this all mean? You know, the system is overwhelmed. On the, on the back of, of lockdown, we were told that at least 6,000 problems were raised, a mix of PGs and just complaints generally. It bogged down the system. All of these are tremendous cost <clears throat> of time, money, and emotional time and effort spent in trying to sort them. We're also seeing employment lawyers, or just lawyers, and advocates that we've never heard of before. One advocate sent me a PG claiming disparagement of treatment. I think and I hope that what he meant was disparity of treatment. Disparity meaning that there was inequality in the way you treated this employee from the other. You fired this guy, you gave this fellow a written warning. Disparagement would be somehow mocking or ridicule. So it's important that we are dealing with people who know what they're up to. It saves time and money. Now, before the holidays, there was an article published by The Guardian, and it caught my eye. And it said, in part, that New Zealanders are experiencing more depression, anxiety since the coronavirus lockdown, despite beating the virus. To be honest, everyone has suffered worldwide. This has been a huge problem. The article then went on to say, what we're seeing is a lift in general anxiety. People are less tolerant of family or situations at work. So stress in general is causing more distress. So just as doctors are seeing problems in their office, we are seeing the flow on effect, I believe, in our office with more discipline, more performance. And even though there was a, a recent um, news about the, 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 the uh, increase in job ads and, and the decline in, in unemployment, we're still seeing people needing to make staff redundant. Now, as tempting as it is to launch into a formal disciplinary process, what I'm finding more and more is the use of a soft process in the early days. Have a conversation with your employee. Try to work out what is going on. Sit down with them along the lines of, I would like to meet with you to discuss what's going on so that we can agree to put in place a process to allow us to go home at the end of the day and feel better about the work we do. It's been a tough year for everyone, let's be honest. Also, as a result of that soft process, we're seeing resignations, and we're also seeing staff come right. <clears throat> in other words, we avoid getting in the queue and getting that red email bouncing back to us. Situations at work. Now, the previous slide talked about family relationships and situations at work. You know, be honest, don't get me started. Situations at work. You know, those doctors, they're writing those medical certificates giving employees weeks off, then we don't hear from them. It's a huge problem. So before I finish on this bit, I want to make sure you understand. 456-1812. That's my phone number. 03-456-1812. If you have a process that you need to get underway, discipline, 
performance, redundancy, incapacity, give me a call. If I'm at my desk, I'm going to pick it up on the first ring. So we've been talking this afternoon about the problems that we've been seeing across our desk. This is the predicted battlefield. I'm going to give you a bit of background on this uh, virus uh, uh, vaccinations and, and uh, information before I move on to this topic. I want you to understand, though, that what I say is going to pale in comparison to the knowledge that my colleague, Paul Mackay from Business New Zealand, is going to give you in about 20 minutes. OK, so there are four types of vaccines using three technologies. <clears throat> the vaccines arrive frozen. Some healthcare professionals are already raising a concern about, about how they're going to handle inoculating people because that thing is frozen. It's got to be thawed before use. If you, if you leave it thawed for too long, it's going to spoil problems, potential problems. The first vaccines that we've been hearing in the news are going to go to border workers and their families and then those people in frontline health care, then the rest of us. There's enough vaccine on order, that's the word, on order for everyone in New Zealand and the Pacific. Vaccines require two doses, except I've heard that Johnson & Johnson company Janssen has developed a single dose vaccine. That'll be great. The problem I heard with that is its efficacy is not quite as good as a double dose. So this is the question that is beginning to crop up. I got my first email about it last night, and I was glad because I want to help. The question is, can an employer require an employee to receive the vaccine? It's not as easy as you might think or hope. It's going to be full of pitfalls. The short answer is yes. If they're new, you can put an employment in their employment agreement, a clause that says, I agree, or the employee agrees to undergo a, a vaccine, COVID-19 vaccine. I might tuck that into the health and safety clause. Clause, nine, uh, yeah, clause 19A, something like that, just after the drug testing. But there's nothing that's going to prevent that guy or that, that woman that you are asking to join your team from taking a pen, scratching through that on religious grounds or just general fear. Frankly, I'm a bit of a hypochondriac, to be honest. And putting his initials by and say, I'm, I'm not going there. Then what are you going to do? What's the phone number? 456-1812. Talk to me. Also remember that we cannot change the terms and conditions of employment of an existing employee, right? You can't do that without their agreement. So you just can't march into their office, plop down a new agreement and says, by the way, there's a clause in there about something, and walk out the door. The original terms and conditions of employment they signed 10 years ago continues. Any changes of, to the law are incorporated by law into that agreement or implied. So you don't need to regularly update the employment agreement. And if you do, it's going to raise a concern, like, why is it trying to get me to change? What's in here? What's that Clause 19A about? Perhaps the best way forward is to adopt the policy. It's interesting. This email I got last night said, we, are, um, we believe we are essential health professionals at our office. And we already have a clause that covers the flu vaccine and some other inoculations. Presto, perfect. If they've already agreed to that, well then I would say there's reasonable grounds to say to that employee, well, you know, the same with the COVID vaccine. I appreciate you have some concerns. We're gonna pay for it, would be my recommendation. Give them the time off work to go and do that. Hopefully the government will come to the party and say, here's some money for employers to, to help their pay for the staff to go for an hour or so off work, those two times to go get the vaccine? We'll see. What's happening overseas? Two leading Australian employment lawyers who are not quite as good as the legal team have said, yeah, you can make those people undergo a vaccination. They have a different approach generally. They have a no, you've seen this in the news this morning 
No, no jab, no pay. No jab, no play. Yeah, if you're a little, if you got a kid in a healthcare, I mean, in a little um, uh, daycare center, that child is going to have to be inoculated for any number of, of potential health problems. There's also, I'm hearing that in Europe, you have um, various trials in some like Germany uh, and France with mandatory vaccinations, and that's not going so well. Far better to have a good faith conversation with your employees. Start it now. Next team meeting, have it just to throw it out there. Follow up in the next team meeting. Get some agreement. Put in place a policy, if at all possible, will help you write it. Stay tuned to the news. See what's going on. See what the feel is. We've got to beat this virus. And I'll tell you why. The further question is this. Can the New Zealand government, even though, even though Jacinda said this morning in the news, I'm not going to make vaccinations uh, mandatory. Can the New Zealand do it? Yes, they can. Why? Well, let's look at Section 11. First of all, the Bill of Rights that protects us from unfair government. And it says that we all have the right to refuse medical treatment. Beautiful. Except Section 5 justified limitations. That means that the government could impose vaccination, make it mandatory, if they thought there was a need for it. I did some online research. Spanish flu, pretty scary stuff. What was happening was, in your head, um, sorry, <laughs> just knocked the uh, recording microphone. Someone would pass in the night from that Spanish flu. The next morning, two policemen would go to the home to collect the body. They were healthy, but by the end of the day, they were deceased. The World Health Organization has said, this is not the big one. David Skagg, I think, was the first person to say that. I remember reading it in the newspaper a couple of months ago. You're nodding your head, yes. It's true. But the big one could be around the corner, and the World Health Organization says it could be because of the, the global environment we live in. Remember, my parents are washing off their groceries. There is belief that that virus can get on a surface and travel in shipping. People are concerned. OK, that's enough about the doom and gloom. <clears throat> Let's try to work this out together, conversations take people's feelings into account. Let's demonstrate to New Zealand how we're going to get this done and, and, and meet that 70% threshold that we got to have to get herd immunity. OK, let's talk quickly about some pays. Uh, it's not going to be too difficult. Um, there's been an update to the, uh, the Equal Pay Amendment Act. It governs equal pay and pay equity. I want to talk about the increases the wages that are coming up, you will know about. And then, I mentioned earlier, I don't think I, I made it clear, I'm turning over the fair pay agreements to Paul, who knows far more about it than I do. So what's up with this Equal Pay Amendment Act? There was the old Equal Pay Act, 1972. Christine Bartlett was working she looking around uh, the work she did and the pay she was receiving, she didn't think it was fair. She raised a complaint. That complaint eventually got all the way to the ERA, NZERA, Employment Relations Authority. And they said, yeah, um, there's a problem here. And then the government stepped in and negotiated a settlement. You all heard about it. That's the Terra Nova. But Christine's efforts raised the awareness about pay equity and the problem with the Equal Pay Act 1972 not addressing pay equity. So what did the government do? They brought in the Equal Pay Amendment Act. So what are these things, equal pay and pay equity? Here are two definitions. The top one is equal pay. Pretty straightforward. Everyone understands. Pretty obvious. If you are a man and a woman, you do the same work you should be paid the same. 
On the other hand, pay equity is a little bit, you know, not iffy. This, it just, you know, it needs, a, it needs a little bit of work to sort it out. And so the new act helps put in place some processes to make that happen. Pay equity is men and work, women working equivalent jobs should be paid the same amount. This considers consideration of what is to be measured. Who's going to be affected? Well, it's already started. I got an email attaching, well, actually, I got the phone call, 456 1812. Picked it up on the first ring, you know. There you go. Hey, that's right. Thanks. Um, and yeah, hey, uh, yeah, who, oh, hey, haven't heard from you. How's it going? Yeah, well, what? We got a what? Dated 6 November, what? So the day the new law came into effect, a union was already sending out to child care centers a 40-page document about their pay, their, their pay equity claim to the employers. Oh, by the way, the first couple of pages were about the claim. The rest of that, 30 pages, was all around the, listing all the daycare centers that were now involved being dragged into this. All right. Here are the employers that could be affected, retail, hospitality, service, education, health. If this is your line of work, you need to be aware this is going to happen sooner than later, maybe later. We're there to help you get your head around it. It's not that hard. It's going to be fun, actually. It'll be fun. <laughs> Hear me out. Okay, so this is the rough guide to a pay equity claim. You're going to get it in the mail. You're going to acknowledge it. Thank you for the pay equity claim. Perfect. Um, you have then 45 days to, to let the, the other uh, the person who sent it to you um, know whether you believe it is arguable. That sounds pretty heavy duty. It's actually not. Because when you read the legislation, and by the way, never be afraid to read the legislation. It's kind of fun. And if you ring, I won't repeat that number, you will be, you know, we'll have a good time discussing the legislation. What does that mean? I don't know. In fact, nobody knows what the Pay Equity Amendment Act 2000, whatever, 2020, means because there's no case law around it. It's just what it is, okay? All right, so what's the process? All right, not, you know, uh, acknowledge the receipt of the claim. 45 days, is it arguable? Yes, it's going to be arguable. If you, if, it, if you don't agree it's going to be arguable, you'll be taken to mediation or maybe even dragged to the ERA. And then the legislation says, take a light touch approach to whether it's arguable. Arguable is not the, bat, not the war. It's not even a battle. It's like preparation for battle. So acknowledge, have a think around whether it's an arguable case, acknowledge it could be arguable, then move forward. Then you should notify the other staff who could be affected within 20 days. And then the fun really begins. And I mean this, I think this could be fun, though. I think Paul's going to take a different, different view of it. We'll talk later, Paul. It involves this process. And it's set out in the legislation, 13ZD. We have to assess something, the work, and then we have to compare the jobs to other jobs to see if it's an issue with pay equity. Look at what we're assessing. The skills, the responsibilities, the conditions of work, the degree of effort required, the level of experience, and a few other things. There may be another further part to that section that kind of builds on that. But look, let's quickly look at 13ZE. Looks familiar. Skills, experience, responsibilities, working conditions, degrees of effort, remember? Skills required, responsibilities. So it's pretty straightforward stuff. And you're looking for a comparator that you can rely on and build a discussion around. Notice I didn't say argument. This is not lawyer v. lawyer. Thank goodness. There's enough of that. Let's get on with a discussion. And if you get one of these claims, appoint one person in your team to handle the paperwork because there's going to be quite a lot of documents developed as you work through the, the assessing and, and then identifying relevant um, comparators. Keep legal privilege in mind. 
keep legal privilege in mind. Anything that might say, I might say to you over the telephone or uh, an email is not going to be part of this. You don't want to be seen to be perhaps admitting to something. Remember, the process is a collaboration. It's not an argument. It's not debate. It's not adversarial. And this, I, I wish I could take credit for it because I love this kind of language. It's open discovery and flexible investigation. That's a, a union rep from Australia who put that out there. And there's some tools being developed, Paul will mention these, to help you. And like I said, there's no case law, so there's a sense of feeling it out as you go. Oh, by the way, um, our, our training team is looking at developing a course around this. It'll be fun. Okay, pays. A minimum wage is going up one April, we all know that. $20 an hour. Training wage also going up 16 hour, $16 an hour. Starting out wage going up the same. And the uh, MB says, that, or the government says, this will put $216 million into the economy, into people's pockets. That's great. It's got to come from somewhere. By the way, does anybody know the um, living wage right now? Somebody tell me. 22 what? 22.10. But it, could, it changes and it will change. Currently, 22.10. All right. I'll take, I'll take if, I, if I give that Australian union rep the um, open discovery, I'm going to take credit for Mondayization mayhem. <laughs> That's what's happening. There's a number of public holidays this year and next year that are going to be Mondayized. And a couple of them will be Tuesdayized because a couple of them will be Mondayized. I kind of like the sound of Tuesday eyes better than Monday eyes. Tuesday eyes terror? I don't know. I'll still work. I'll work on that. Here they are. The, 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 the holidays are the, the Monday eyes this year, and then Tuesday eyes down at the bottom the, the, the day after Christmas. There'll be pl plenty. Your, your staff will let you know or, or have questions about it. And, and we've already fielded a lot of questions, let's be honest. And what they want to know, staff, if it's Monday, I get two holidays, right? <laughs> well, this question is so common. Look, it's, this is MB. Google it. Mondayization, a public holidays flow chart. I'll send them an email that we all agree this should be called the Mondayization Mayhem public holiday flow chart and see if they will change it. Okay, so here it is, and it's kind of fun because in the upper um, right-hand corner, <laughs> does the public holiday fall on a weekend? And then over this way, yes. Is it Christmas Day, Boxing Day, New Year's, or January 2nd? No, this way. Would it normally have, would you normally have worked on this day? Yes. Would you normally work both the calendar day and the Monday? See, it's building you up in suspense, right? Yes, no, yes. Is this no or yes? You do not get two public holidays, see, in black. That MB has to do this points to the fact that this is, you know, mayhem and the public holidays, you know, the Holidays Act. Paul, can't wait to get up here and tell you about it. This bill... Submissions on this bill closed the 28th of January, and I had the honor to review the Business New Zealand submission on this. It was quite good, and I have borrowed their key points to satisfy my own legal position on this. Bad, 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 bad. But in all fairness, after Business New Zealand worked through all the bad, they put forward a really reasonable alternative or solution. And Paul's going to tell you about that. Let's move on to the Privacy Act. Mainly what's changed is this. It's a global world we live in. Data's flying around. Data has value. Facebook is making tons of money. As a new 
information privacy principle 12, IPP 12, that handles that. There's some other things you need to be aware of. Let's just jump down to the bottom. Increased enforcement powers and new criminally, criminal offenses and a $10,000 fine. That's, that's bigger than it used to be. Why is that a concern? I'll tell you about it as, a, as you quickly move through IPP 12. You know, there was some press around this, around the holidays, and it was kind of cool because there was some, some you know, text in there that was, there's that microphone again, some text in there that was uh, kind of gold and shimmering and it drew your eye to it and you're wondering what was this about? And what I want to recommend that you do is that your next, league, uh, next team meeting after you've covered the COVID, and also throw out the notion that, hey, let's appoint, well, let's have some volunteers. Let's have Catherine review I, IPP1, Will, IPP2, Mandy, 3, Kate, 4, and so on, and go online to privacy.org.nz. You have a play with their Privomatic, you know, tool, and then you come back and report on it briefly at our next team meeting. Why? Because of the new criminal offenses and the new increased penalties. Take a look at section 211, section 1A. This is really why you want to read the law. Anything done or admitted by a person A as an employee of another person B is to be treated as being done or admitted by both A and B, whether or not it was done or admitted by, with B's knowledge or approval. Meaning you're gonna get hit if you're the employer. Except, except let's look, take a look at the section just below. Remember we're looking at 211, one, and then 211B. D, two, that phone threw me. 211.2, in proceedings under this act, against any person C, in respect of an act alleged to have been done by an employee of that person D, it is a defense to prove that C took such steps as reasonably practicable to prevent D from doing that or any similar act. Okay, so you cover it in your team meeting. Catherine, one. Will, two. Mandy, three, and so on. Kate, four. And before you know it, everyone's got a little debrief on the privacy principles. You can send a thank you email. You can have that box tick just in case. Case note 298757 creeps its ugly head in your workplace. What was that about? Well, you can read all the specifics. You can just Google that. Case note, you can get it. You won't get the names and I'm not sharing the names with you because I don't know them, but I'll use Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Smith. So Mr. and Mrs. Smith happened to go to their doctor's office and the receptionist was there, of course, and the receptionist went to a party. And some people at the party said, hey, uh, we saw Mr. and Mrs. Smith going uh, into the healthcare center the other day, what's up? Oh, I can't tell you anything about that, of course. And then the party continues for a while and before you know it, after being pressured by her friends, the receptionist had told the others that they had been to the center for a sexual health test, an SDD. Of course, they got right back to the Smiths the next day. They raised a complaint with the privacy commissioner who then investigated. The employer investigated what the employee had done. She got fired and the Smiths were told in an email that they had a good chance of taking this to the Human Rights Tribunal, except that they stopped returning the emails from the privacy commissioner. So at this point, they, the employer is lucky they got off. I mean, they, they escaped what could have been a real problem. Remember, in employment jurisdiction, while you can take an employment relations problem to the ERA, if it fits, you could also take it to the rights tribunal. And they are quite serious and they impose huge fines. So for the sake of the employer, I hope that they, it was just over. I hope their t the uh, Smith's tests were negative and everybody was fine.
Oh, by the way, this is new. This is also new. Section 50, there's always been an exception for evaluative material. You're reviewing an employee's suitability for promotion. You want to keep that under wraps. You, have, you could have some comments in there that may not be taken very well by that employee. Well, Section 50 now says any document created in the ordinary course of employment will have to be turned over. That's not covered by the exception of evaluative material. So what this means is that your performance reviews need to be handed over to the employee. Well, you might say, oh, what's the big deal with that? I mean, you've got, you, you, you call the employee to a meeting, you give him that performance review, you conduct a process, and if it goes pear-shaped, as you say, and he raises a PG, he should, he should have all that material, except he's probably not going to turn over everything, and he's going to get his lawyer to come to you with a privacy, Privacy Act 2020, Section 50 request. Everything in the normal course of employment. And if you turn over a, a, a performance review with some notes in it that says something derogatory, there could be problems. So keep that in mind. Okay, quickly, COVID-19 business support. They're not on this list, but by the top of this list should be the RBP folks at the Tiger Chamber, our new partners. There are loans, and there's just one lingering kind of wage subsidy that's out there, and that's at the bottom of the COVID-19 leave support scheme. If, if you have an employee who needs to isolate, self-isolate, there's money to support their wages. <clears throat> and then we have uh, at the bottom here uh, our the link to our website that provides all that information. Go there. And the privacy commissioner site. Case law, I'm on the uh, final stretch here, folks. You're doing well. Do you see this headline? Do you see it? Yeah, poor guy. <laughs> poor guy. Well, his, his, his colleagues, my, my colleague, <laughs> thank you, Catherine. Your, 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 your comments is noted. Uh, I'll talk to you later, Catherine. <clears throat> well, you know, his colleague said he was just joking around. He was a fun-loving guy. And, uh, he, you know, he, he was glad maybe he beat the virus. Who wouldn't, right? He survived. People are dying, right? He goes in. He wasn't called in to work. He goes in. He does something he shouldn't have done. And, uh, by the way, they were essential workers. And the problem really wasn't that he was, um, um, you know, putting his saliva all over the windows and stuff, as bad as that was. And he, I'll come back to that. Um, it was what Dr. Ashley Bloomfield, the directive he gave during lockdown said, that if you're not an essential worker going about your essential duties, don't go out. Well, of course, he, he was a central worker, but he wasn't doing his duties. So he was arrested and he was fined $1,500. The article I saw, uh, I think it was in the Herald, it might have been Stuff, I don't know, said one of them said $1,500 and he got fired. And I was very interested to know about that. And I kept looking and researching. I could not find, has anybody found any evidence other than that little, little comment? Also, I got fired. Yeah, I don't, you know what? I, I bet he wasn't fired. That's my take on it. I think that the employer probably looked at this and said, yeah, not ideal. I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt. Everyone's under stress. Why does it matter? <clears throat> because it's probably gonna happen again or something like it, something, somebody's gonna do something in the workplace that is contrary to what Dr. I call him pretty boy, Bloomfield says, and then get arrested. And this is what you need to know. If the police are involved in a workplace matter and they're conducting an investigation, that doesn't let the employer off the hook. So here, here we go. Police investigation, employment investigation, you're looking for what's called the nexus. There's got to be this connection. Clearly, in the council worker down in, in Invercargill, there was a clear connection. What he did directly related 
to workplace. If he'd been arrested for drunk driving, that may or may not have had as close connection to Nexus. If there is a Nexus, the employer cannot rely on what the police are doing. They've got to conduct their own investigation. Remember the police, beyond reasonable doubt, employment, civil matter, balance of probabilities is much more flexible. But as, 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 as good as it is, we have this case, and this is uh, Judge Inglis of the, of the um, Employment Court, and, and she's got a quote here from a case, we got a quote here from a case saying that the, 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 the employer's got to do his own investigation. Just remember this, there was a guy at work in Auckland, he was uh, at his desk doing his job. The cops, hello, who is it? The police, open up. Okay, what do you want? You, come, take him away. And the employer is sitting there going like, I can't believe what happened. Dear John, I couldn't help but notice today the police came and took you away. You're fired. Yeah. Welcome to my world. It's, it is interesting, it's fascinating, and I'm passionate about it. Some say I'm out to save the world. <clears throat> the cops got the wrong guy. They went to the wrong workplace. They arrested the wrong guy, okay? The cops are only human too. You would hope those cops got a uh, discipline meeting letter, right? <laughs> Dear Constable Smith, once again, you have arrested the wrong you know, person. <laughs> also, if there is this nexus, remember this police investigation that links with the workplace, you might get your employee standing on their right to silence. And they have that ability in the circumstances to stand on the right of silence. Thankfully, once again, Judge Inglis to the rescue. She's now the chief judge. That's gonna come up in just a minute. And she's saying that, I don't care, essentially, um, all right, right to silence is important, but also the duty of good faith, section one, uh, section four of one A, B, the Employment Relations Act, you're gonna to have to be responsive and communicative. All right, that's great. But if the, if the employee still doesn't, refuses to come to a discipline meeting, or they sit there at the discipline meeting and doesn't, don't say anything. Um, what's that number again? Thanks very much. Excellent. Give me a call, we'll talk. We'll think up of a strategy. We'll put in place a process to achieve something. And here's, here's what you need to know. Start a process. I guarantee you something's gonna happen. Here's the problem. I can't tell you what's gonna happen. It could be a miraculous recovery. It could be a medical certificate off for a month. It could be a resignation. It could be a, a PG. But at least you have the satisfaction of knowing, I just made that happen. <coughs> Judge Inglis again. Remember that name, just those two, two slides before? Police investigations. Employers have to conduct their own investigation, right to silence. He can't sit on his backside and not say anything. Well, she was the one dissenting judge in this big case about the wage subsidy. And I have a huge problem with that. The employer won the day in the end because there, it, it was heard by a full bench. Three judges, two of them agreed with the employer's position. One of them disagreed, that was Judge Inglis. Meaning it's probably gonna go now to the next court. Remember ER, mediation, ERA, employment court, court of appeal, Supreme Court. Because she, she dissented and did not agree with the majority, this could go on. All right, so what, what happened here was these guys were essential workers. It was, you know, lockdown, goodness sake. Minimum wage, you know, they, they, they got the, the wage subsidy. Uh, they, they weren't working, so they didn't get the full minimum wage. You know. And then the minimum wage went up and during lockdown, April 1 last year, and so they lost even more money, so they raised a PG. 
And this is what the, this is paragraph one. This is all you really need. Paragraph one of the Employment Relations Authority Determination. Just cast your eyes on this. Gate Gourmet New Zealand Limited carries on business at Auckland Airport, providing in-flight catering services to passenger aircraft, both domestically and internationally. In other words, read between the lines, they're a huge you know, multinational corporation, and they got the money to throw around. Never mind that we were in lockdown and nobody knew what was going on. We were just doing our best. And you guys deserve a lot more credit. I'm telling you, it was very difficult. You held your act together, and maybe you got a PG like this guy here like this company. And of course, the ERA found for the employee. Here's the first paragraph from the employment court decision. The proceedings before the court arose in the context of COVID-19 pandem lockdown, pandemic, level four lockdown, initiated by the government. It sets the circumstances, it paints, begins to paint a picture of what's actually going on. Remember, Section 103, the test of you, the fair and reasonable employer, you, requires a couple of things. One, you got to have substance. What did that person do with that plastic gore marching around out there, banging up that, did you see that in the news? Teacher. You have substance, you also have a process around that. But that's all filtered through the circumstances. In Gate Gourmet, the circumstances were the pandemic, we we deserve, you deserve more credit. The employment court finally said so. Problem that there was one judge who disagreed. All right, so finally, look, what does the road ahead hold for us? I don't know. Do you know? I'd like to know. Maybe you're bopping along on the Nevis Road thinking, this is great. I'm on my way to Kingston. I haven't booked a hotel room yet. I'm just hoping I'll find one, right? And then a sign, 27 Fords to be crossed ahead, <laughs> use caution. Each one of those Fords, there's a, um, a bumper or a part of the undercarriage of a car or a license plate. In other words, other people have been less successful. You don't know what's up ahead. A couple of things to keep in mind. This is, I think, is our fallback position. It's all about good faith. This is what Margaret Wilson said in 2000 when, when they were discussing the Employment Relations Bill. She said, and this is beautiful. Well, the first time I heard this, I loved it. And I, it's stuck in my mind ever since. Employment is a human relationship involving issues of mutual trust, confidence, fair dealing, and is simply not contractual economic exchange. If you were here last year, you might have remembered I was going on a bit about this. Of course, the problem with that is it imports the full range of human nature because it is a human relationship, the good and the bad part. But maybe it's time that we hearken back to this as a guide for the road ahead. We're there to support you. Thank you very much. I can't say that enough. I love my job. I'm passionate about employment law. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn it over to Paul. Our second speaker is Paul Mackay, Manager of Employment Relations Policy at Business New Zealand. Paul has over 30 years high-level experience in the fields of industrial relations, employment law, labor, market policy, strategic planning, change management, and human resources in central government, state-owned enterprise, and the private sector. Paul has been involved in high-level reviews of many aspects of employment law, in particular health and safety, employment relations, and most recently, the Holidays Act. Paul's the real deal. In addition to his New Zealand duties, Paul has many occasions represented New Zealand overseas, internationally in the International Labor Organization, as well as acting as a spokesperson for the International Organization of Employers, or IOE, on employment-related matters. He's been to Geneva at least 50 times. Paul? Yes, sir. Thanks, David, and welcome, everybody. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with Business New Zealand, as I think as uh, Virginia said at the beginning of this, uh, we, we are all part of one network. And, and welcome to the Chambers in Otago as well. You're now part of what we regard as the Business New Zealand family or the Business New Zealand network. Our job in Wellington effectively is to represent the interests of yourselves that percolate up through into the policy discussions that happen and eventually turn into things like policies or laws. 
So what we do is not actually seen a lot in the sense of, of, of day-to-day life. What David's talked to you about is what happens after all of the conversations are over in Wellington and the laws are passed and you then have to get to grips with them. So what I'd like to talk about a bit today is the sort of conversations that you don't see but are coming forward or growing at the moment and will, will come forward and turn into some sort of reality for you and give you some insight not only to that but also the context in which some of this takes place, why it's actually happening and the context that David referred to in terms of those court cases is as applicable to all of the other policy issues too is is there's a framework if you like that this stuff fits into and understanding where some of the things you hear and see about uh, are are, are coming forward you can see kind of where they fit into the the grand scheme of things so very quickly I'll just go past those this is the second term government and its first term we have seen ah great thanks We've seen the, uh, the passage of the Equal Pay Act that David talked about. We saw all those changes to the Employment Relations Act, the removal of 90-day trial periods and a whole bunch of stuff like that. We saw the other smaller bits like the domestic violence or family violence uh, leave provisions put in, uh, the Triangular Relationships Bill, which basically gives the right of people who are labour hire employees working for a client to take a, a grievance against the client as well as their employer. Those sorts of things are already in and they're already passed. Shortly to come through, or this year, particularly we're going to see the passage of the film industry or Hobbit Law Bill, uh, which deals with the issue of contractors working in the film industry. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll mention that specifically because it has some importance for you in the future. Uh, fair pay agreements, which of course is the flagship um, um, kind of policy of the Labour government and particularly a fond uh, flagship issue for the union movement. And the Holidays Act, which of course has been bugging us all for far too long now. And then there are some big policy issues flowing through that we've seen uh, in the area of contractors. You, many of you may have seen the consult consultation paper that came out last year from MB talking about what to have, what to do with contractors and, and dependent contractors in particular. And then there's this issue, there's an issue the, the future of work, which if you recall in 2014 when Labor didn't get elected, they set up the Future of Work Commission that Grant Robertson then went around the country talking about how, we, how will we manage the future. And that has now coalesced into a specific set of kind of directions, which again will have some quite material effects in this country if they come to pass. So we'll cover those all very briefly, I have to say, because each of those is covered by submissions and things that are quite lengthy. If any of you are interested, if you Google Business New Zealand and go to our submissions page, it's public, it's free. All of those submissions that, that are mentioned and these sorts of things are available there. Just quickly though on COVID, this is the story of COVID as it literally as of yesterday, basically. The blue is how many cases we've actually had in total. And you see we had the initial flurry and then we had a flat bit and then we started letting people into the country and we've been climbing a little bit steadily ever since. The gray is who's recovered. And the difference basically at the moment is the current cases plus the few, the 25 people that have died, uh, but we've done very well. The yellow little uh, squiggle there is the number of active cases at any given time. And you see the big blip in the first uh, phase the little bump in the, in the middle there was the big Auckland outbreak, but much smaller than the national one. And since then, we've been sort of trundling along at a pretty steady but low rate. The thing is, and the success of why we've had a low rate, um, but also one of our problems, quarantine, the blue represents how many beds there are available. Uh, the big steps down in October last year, they decided they actually had too many beds available, so cut a 1,000 out. The big step down subsequently is they changed the way they counted uh, things. Instead of counting actual beds, they've now started counting rooms available and there could be more people in one room. But other than that, you can see there's quite a lot of blue. In other words, on, on the face of it, there are a lot more beds available than are being occupied. Even though you hear in the news every single day that the MIQ is saying, sorry, we can't let, even individuals can't get a bed in MIQ. Uh, and, that's, and the reason that for that uh, MB are saying is, or the MIQ people are saying is, we are booking 14 days ahead, and it's all about the bookings. That might be true, but the reality is, even with the bookings supposedly uh, soaking up all the available space, the reality is that they're not. So there's an inherent inefficiency there, which is a problem for at two levels. At the one point, we can say it's working because the disease is staying inside the quarantine centres, by and large, or very much so but it's not letting nearly enough people through because the system seems to have an efficiency built into it that is preventing particularly employers bringing in skills and preventing people who need to be home for you know, urgent reasons 
or more of them than, than seem to be the case. So Business New Zealand in its role is pushing on government and particularly immigration, in fact, we're meeting them again tomorrow, uh, to find out what this kind of problem is between, or the mismatch between what they book and what actually happens. Because there's clearly room for improvement and we're, we're certainly looking for something there. Just very quickly, at, at, since we've started the MIQ process, that orange line represents the number of people who have been caught at the border. And the yellow line represents the community cases that escaped into the, into the community or occurred in the community. The big bump there is the Auckland uh, outbreak last year and the little middle bumps were the two or three cases. And that tiny little spot of yellow on the right is the current two cases that occurred just a, a week ago. So you can see by and large, all of our issues are contained. Although you have to also note that there's an upwards trend to what's being contained at the border. There are more cases arriving and they are a concern, of course, because the more there are, the more chances there are of escape into the community. That I won't dwell on. It's just the story of the entire pandemic. Uh, you'll be able to see these slides and you can see the, the story for itself, but it just represents what I've already showed you. In terms of lockdowns, the issues that we have to face uh, is that when we got locked down last year, we didn't know what was coming. We didn't know what the lockdown system was. We were told on a Tuesday, I think it was, that we were going, we, we had a new four level system and that we were already at level two. And we were told that two days later we'd be at level three and after that we'd be at level four. So we had no time to prepare. The businesses basically and everybody went home. And then we started this rolling mall of discussions about who was essential and who could actually then start working and who couldn't. Uh, and we had all sorts of debates, uh, for instance, greenkeepers and golf courses and bowling greens, for instance, were all told that they were not essential and had to stay home. If any of you play bowls or, or know about golf, bowls or golf, you'll know that the greens are actually not grass, they're weeds, and they have to be looked after extremely carefully, constantly, to make sure grass doesn't get into them. Otherwise, they have to dig them up and start again. And so we had this you know, screaming from all over the country coming to us and saying, we'll have to dig up every golf course and bowling green in the country. And in the finish, we discovered two things. One is the people who made that decision didn't know anything about golf or bowls. Um, and secondly, um, it was easy enough to point out that green keepers in both those places don't stick around, aren't around people. You, know, you can't have them on the green while the bowlers are bowling or the golfers are golfing. So it became relatively straightforward in the finish to have some logic and say, these people can operate safely even at level four. And as time went on, we found more and more examples of that. Point is that now we've got relatively contained, but we now have these more virulent strains of the virus around. And we also have a, a concern, you hear it from Ashley Bloomfield, that not enough people are doing enough scanning. And scanning is the way that we find out who is in contact with who quickly and respond quickly. Without that scanning and with the presence of a, of a more virulent strain in the community, the only thing the government can really do in the first instance is lock down again. Say, so everybody stay home, stand still until we trace the people that, we, that we've got. And what we want now is certainty about what happens if that occurs in terms of who can keep operating because they can operate safely. There are a lot more people and we know a lot more about who can operate safely. So again, tomorrow we'll be meeting officials and government about pursuing the rules that will apply as almost certainly will happen. There will be some form of community escape and we'll have to confront this issue. So there's an issue there. The quarantine and isolation I've mentioned, the court cases, David mentioned Gate Gourmet and the and the the a very limited view of the Employment Relations Authority in terms of applying ordinary everyday rules to the situation of the lockdown and the wage subsidy. The, 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 the Dove name up there represents a hospice who also had to go through the shutdown. In this instance, they did what many, if not most businesses did. They negotiated with their employees to reduce their wages to 80% of normal because they're obviously being shut, they weren't going to have any money. And the employees agreed. But one of the, the union representing one of the employees took it to the authority who said, no, you didn't go through a process of proper consultation. You should have taken time and allowed time for the employees to respond and consult their unions or their lawyers uh, and all those things. Those are, that's proper process. You didn't do it. Therefore, you must pay all your employees all their full wages for that period, including any arrears, which, of course, they couldn't do because they weren't any, earning any money. If anything represents the issue of, of, of uh, circumstances, this case does, and it's coming up in April, and once again, Business New Zealand intervened in the Gate Gourmet case and, and led the employer argument. We'll be doing it again because there are many, many businesses for whom having to pay the difference between 80% and 100% of wages is as bad as having to pay between the subsidy and the minimum wage. So there's a big point of principle here about having to take into context the, the decision they took. And remember, that decision was taken in two days flat, from Monday to Wednesday, 
from two, level two to level four lockdown, that company managed to get 100% of its employees to agree to something, which is pretty damn good in the circumstances. The, the, so, but the Employment Relations Authority didn't see that. So we're hopeful that we'll see this one through as well. Briefly on vaccines, the big success for vaccines is that we get everybody vaccinated as quickly as possible. And we know supply of vaccines is going to be an issue. Today or yesterday we heard that Pfizer is going to be starting to supply, uh, but only about 500,000 uh, doses or, or vials at the moment, which is about enough for 250,000 people in the, in the short term. But getting them out quickly is also important. And all the viruses that are available out is important. And we have now businesses coming and saying, look, we can help. The more places there are to vaccinate, the more people that are available to do the vaccinations, the better. And there are businesses out there who are saying we have medical centres or medical facilities or trained people. Uh, we'd like to be part of the process. And we are actually talking to the Ministry of Health about how that might happen. But the other side of the coin is uh, the vaccine itself makes a difference. The Pfizer vaccine, the one that's coming, has to be stored at minus 70 degrees centigrade. And there's only about five places in the country that can handle that. So all of the help in the world, off, or the extra help in the world won't help because it can only be processed through a small number of places. So what we also are going to need is these other vaccines, the ones that don't need to be stored at minus 70, but just in ordinary freezers, to get out there so that we can actually spread them more widely through the community. And that's another area we are pushing on, is, is trying to get clarity around the availability and the dispersion of, of vaccines so that as many people as possible are as vaccinated as soon as possible. On to pay equity. I'm not going to go through that because David has, other than to point out two things. All of the claims to date have been in the state sector uh, and it, you know, there's social workers and a whole bunch of others uh, and it's not hard. In the context of what David talked about in terms of process, it's pretty easy because generally speaking, there's only one employer in government. It's the government itself. It's the only one purse of money for the issue to come out of. The private sector is different, of course, because there's 300, 400,000 employers in the private sector who are not you know, tied to one purse. Uh, and therein lies an issue the government has yet to confront. David mentioned that the, the uh, childhood centres have now received the claim literally the day the Act was passed. Childhood centres are both inside the state sector and in the private sector. And as David explained, the process for pay equity requires coordination between employers. The problem is, and the government hasn't thought about this, is there's no body or way or mechanism to coordinate employers established. So if you think about early childhood, there's multiple employers, uh, even, the, even associations, there are multiple associations in the childhood, early childhood sector. There's Montessori, there's Rudolf Steiner, there's kindergarten, there's the Presbyterians, the Catholic, the Muslims, you know, there's multitudes of them. Many of them don't associate each other with each other and some of them act actively hate each other. So the ability to have a good faith conversation about bringing employers together is mechanically very difficult and that hasn't been built into the system. So there's a lot of work to be done around coordinating the process and then there's the information issue. The government set up a repository of information that so people who actually get claims through can put what they've learned in terms of comparative information and data into this repository that can be drawn on then by others. There's a problem there too, is that having the concept of people putting this information in requires them to be willing to put it in. And we're already finding government departments that don't want to provide it. And some unions who have tried to go to private sector organisations and larger employers seeking information on comparative basis are saying, well, my, my um, registered nurses in my aged care home uh, or the DHB want to be compared to engineers in the Glenbrook Steel Mill, just being slightly <coughs> facetious. So they've gone off to metaphorically Glenbrook Steel Mill and said, give us all your pay information for your engineers who then ring Business New Zealand and say, what should we say? And I've, I'll translate it freely, but it said, go away. Um, the, the, the very concept of demanding information, which businesses have always held to themselves as commercially sensitive or competitively sensitive, is now being demanded as a, as a way of dealing with something the state sector has, has dealing with, but haven't given any thought to how it works in the private sector. So there's a challenge ahead when David said, Paul has a different view. My different view is the practical difficulties of doing with a, with a system, which, as he said, can be fun in the, in, the, in the contained sense. There's no fun at all when you can't coordinate it. The Film Industry Working Group, I'll just mention, uh, again, as an introduction to the wider concept of contractors. You remember 2010, the huge stoush uh, with the late Helen Kelly, for instance, about contractors in the film industry who wanted to be 
uh, given things like redundancy entitlements and employment rights, and the court found that that uh, had a had a, uh, a degree of um, uh, agreement to it. That, of course, then had the overseas Warner Brothers and all the others saying, you create employment out of these people, you give them the right to strike, we can't afford to have our film industry working disrupted, so we're just going to pull their film industry investment out of New Zealand. And you'll remember then that the, the national government under John Key introduced the so-called Hobbit Law, which protected the status of contractors in the film industry, and Labour, for its part, said, as soon as we get into power, we're going to get rid of it. As soon as they got into power, we, they said, we're going to get rid of it, and the film industry said, well, okay, fine, we'll just pull out again. So that led to a, well, what can we do? And it led to this, which is a compromise that says contractors will remain contractors in the film industry, but they are to be allowed to negotiate collectively about the things that their contracts will contain, so they won't change their status, but they will they have a capacity or a mechanism to negotiate collectively. A lot of hype about that, but in the finish, it doesn't actually change much because the film industry has always had a set of protocols around who gets what. Contractors that come to the to the to a film, for instance, they all know basically how it works, what the hours of work will be, what their uh, pay rates will be, because they're all they're all kind of negotiated at a central level inside the general, the global film industry, and they're codified, and well, they're in a book called the Blue Book that's always been there. So really all that's happening is codifying what they've done. But what's really important is that particular proposal, or that bill, introduces a new model of doing things, which is a, it was one of the choices that will emerge in this contracting conversation. So that's the point I want to make, is, is it's not watching for what happens in the film industry, which is pretty contained, but the model it provides that could other, be used by others. Fair pay agreements. This is the flagship of the Labour Party. Oops. Um, flagship of the Labour Party and definitely the flagship of the union movement in terms of introducing a, a, a national level collective bargaining process. It's been uh, fraught throughout. Uh, there was a working party in 2018 that re reported and we still have not seen. The, the report was released but no decisions have been taken other than post-election where the Labour Party has said it's got to get on with it. And over Christmas, they had officials working through Christmas on giving advice to government about how to make that report work. Uh, an interesting thing about that report is that it was written by the working group who comprised people from the business sector, from unions and from academia, led by Bill, Jim Bolger. The thing about that is not one person on that particular group has any experience of national level collective bargaining, and most of them had no experience of collective bargaining at all. So they were effectively a group looking at whatever information they could get. And funnily enough, if you recall, we had a national award system from 1894 to 1990, which was a national collective bargaining system. That system is not available for a search in the general sense, because all of the information about it is still in books. It's not digitized. And so it wasn't available for research. So, so that they didn't compare what they were recommending with history. And as, uh, as, uh, as I'll show you, much of what they've recommended, almost all of what they've recommended, in fact, is recreating what we used to have from 1894 to 1990. So we have problems ahead uh, because there are practical issues as well as philosophical ones. Firstly, what are they? They will bind, it's a single, think of it as a collective agreement, it will bind everybody in a common occupation or an industry. Uh, that's yet to be decided. But let's say it's for all, as it was in the, in the previous, pre-1990, let's say there'll be one for all electricians, one for all nurses, well, in fact, there is one for all nurses, uh, all hairdressers, all everybody in a particular country, right across the country. Uh, it will be bargained for between the unions and industry organisations, so individual employers are not the bargaining agents here. There will have to be a coordinating, an employer coordinating body that does it on behalf of whatever group's being negotiated for. You won't be allowed to strike for these things, but what the report recommends and the government says it's accepted is that where the award or the fair pay agreement doesn't provide for as much as people like, there's nothing stopping them going and bargaining in the ordinary or traditional way that we've had at the company level for, a, for a, in effect, another collective agreement on top for which you can strike. And that's important, and I'll show you why. However, that said, I think everything I've said so far is pretty illustrative of the fact that this system will be compulsory in the sense that a union can initiate it, employers can't do anything about that. Unions, the employers have to negotiate and they can't not. Uh, and if they can't agree with the union, 
then an arbitration body will step in and make the decision for them. So there's no ability to walk away from bargaining as you can now with collective bargaining. There is simply no escape. Once this process starts, there will be a decision whether or not you agree it or somebody else makes it for you. And then it will be able to be enforced by the union movement. That's compulsory by any definition. The issue that we've raised is that in 2003, uh, the, new, the Labour government, back then, ratified the Freedom of Association and Collective Bargaining Convention, which is an international treaty, which enshrines the principle of free and voluntary bargaining. So what Business New Zealand has done is point that out and taken a complaint to the International Labour Organisation, who have now written to the government asking for an explanation. And that process, um, quite frankly, we will, we will play out as long as we possibly can, because as long as there is a possibility or even a probability that the government has breached international law that itself signed up to, there's a bit of pushback. So that's a conversation that's live and well in the background, uh, and it's not known out in the street, but as employers, you ought to know that Business New Zealand is pushing that argument as hard as we possibly can. In fact, we're meeting ministers next week on that point. If we look at some of the practical realities, that graph is strikes from 1921 till now, um, the bars are the number of strikes, and the red is how much time was lost for each strike. That big one, the big blip on the on the left, the red one, is the 1951 water, waterfront strike. That was millions and millions of working hours lost in a short period of time. The big hump in the middle is the 1970s and 80s, uh, and the reason for that hump is awards, by definition, back then didn't give very much because you had to settle at a level that everybody could afford. Even the smallest companies had to be able to afford the wage increase that was negotiated. And over time, as times got tighter. Uh, and the and economy tightened, uh, they got less and less. Until 1968, there was the infamous nil wage order, and that pretty much broke the union's um, attachment to the award system in the sense that they started deregistering from the legal framework that, that, that they had to be part of, and they started bargaining directly with companies outside of the award structure for what they wanted, and of course, outside the award structure, they could strike, and as you can see, they did. In 1990, we got the Employment Contracts Act, which did away with national awards and put all of the collective bargaining into the company level. And we've had that since. Even with the Employment Relations Act that is much more union friendly than the Employment Contracts Act, it kept the enterprise level bargaining focus. And you can see the comparison between what's on the left and the level, the red line particularly, how much strikes been lost, time has been lost to strikes since 1990 is minuscule compared with what preceded it. And that's what we want to avoid. But if we look at where we're going, if we look at what we had was national awards right through to that period, that pink bit, and on top of that, we had unions breaking away in the 70s and 80s, breaking away from the system, not, not, not being encouraged to, but doing it anyway, and creating literally mayhem. Since then, we've had enterprise bargaining alone, and we've had that relative period of peace. And now we're being told that we're going to have another system akin to, or looking like the occupational awards system, in which, not only is it possible, but people are encouraged to bargain on top of the award system, not just break away from it. This is part of it. We're expected to go and get more after the award if you want more. And so I've been doing this stuff now since 1978. And in all that time, and I used to negotiate awards before 1990, I can't see in anything in my experience tells me that it's not going to happen again because I see nothing in the recommendations that would stop it from happening again. So that's a concern I have and one of the reasons why we want to push back. Just in terms of the mechanics of it, just very quickly, the way it will work is a union will have the only right to, to initiate very very low threshold, only 1,000 employees or 10% of the workforce that would be covered. There'll be some criteria to be met in terms of what, who gets covered, uh, and after that there'll be a requirement to actually bargain. The bargaining will be done by the union and an industry body, and like I mentioned with pay equity, let's face it, pay equity settlements will be fair pay agreements. There'll be a whole occupation, primarily women dominated in that particular context, but still an occupation, who will get a collective deal for that occupation. And th in this case, as I said before, there's no industry connection point for early childhood work who, who workers. Neither is there for all um, of many other professions, all clerical workers, who represents them? Who represents all hairdressers? There's a small association that represents some. Um, there's 500, 600,000 clerical workers in this country working for pretty much every company in the country. How on earth is anybody, representative or not, going to represent them in good faith, given there's so many? Got to remember that not only did we not have the ratification of that convention I mentioned before 1990, 
but we didn't have good faith either, which requires a whole lot of obligations on employers, which this system won't allow them to meet. So again, the government's going to have to think about how it's going to, the context in which it's going to interpret good faith now, is clearly it's going to have to be ignored or set aside for some things. And I don't think, in principle, that's not a good idea. And this, hope, this process will be facilitated by this third party I mentioned, be it the Employment Relations Authority or maybe an Arbitration Commission or something like that, that's not decided, but there will be a third party body that will oversee the process. And also, if there's an argument and you can't strike, there has to be some sort of process for dispute management. And ultimately, this will go then to the decision-making body, be it the Arbitration Commission, or whatever else, who will make a decision that can then be enforced, be it all occupations in an industry or simply all occupations and occupations across all industries. My pick, personally, it's not decided, but my pick is it will be occupations, mainly because if you take an industry approach, every industry has something of everybody. The dairy industry has chief executives, accountants, lawyers, you name it, uh, and so does every other industry. And if the dairy industry settled a deal, and manufacturing industry then said got, got a deal that wasn't as good as the dairy industry or was looking at a deal, they would want better than the dairy industry, and of course we start doing this which is precisely what happened in the 70s and 80s and saw us nearly bankrupt at the, in the end of the Muldoon era when we had the wage price freeze to try and stop that happening. So again, we don't want to recreate history by allowing an industry approach to take us into that place. So for those reasons, I think there will be a push for an occupational basis, but I may be wrong. So in terms of the impact, as I said, you can read these things online but one thing I'd like to point out, the middle there says fair pay agreements will disenfranchise unions. There's 135 unions in this country. Uh, only 30 odd are affiliated to the Council of Trade Unions, which itself is affiliated through to the national, international union movement. So that, you know, those, that, that, that group is what you'd roughly call unionism in the sense of the, you know, the traditional thinking about the kind of socialist approach to unionism. Almost all of the rest are little practical bodies called unions who exist primarily to give the right of employees to have a collective agreement. They don't want to be fussed with international union politics and anything else like that. They are simply there to facilitate or enable the creation of a collective agreement for the employees they represent. The, the core union movement doesn't like these little unions. They're not really them. They're not part of the club. They don't think like them. They're just you know, the, local, the local club. And there's always attempts going on by the core union movement to try and push these people out. And now comes the chance. For instance, clerical workers, there are 30 unions that represent clerical workers. Only one, the PSA, is affiliated with the CTU. The CTU, the PSA is huge, it's 55, 60,000 members. And so it could, with a snap of its fingers, initiate an FPA, given those low criteria, for clerical workers. And in the same breath, disenfranchise 29 other unions, the ones that don't belong to the CTU. So there's other issues. There's more than just what happens to employment or employees or employers. There's an inter-union issue to this too, which serves the ends of some and not the others. It, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting fact. It won't necessarily affect you at a day-to-day -day level unless you are associated with one of those little unions and end up having to deal with the mainstream union movement instead of the, the local friendly uh, one-stop shop type that, you've, that, that there are many of. And again, as I said, we, we think it breaches international law. Where are the most likely ones? The Two ways to this uh, answer. One is to do a whole lot of analysis, which we've done, which says median wages, middle wages, low paid groups, high paid groups, uh, hard, hard, hard you know, price takers and price makers, and you end up with a list that has drivers and various other people in it. And then there's the squeaky wheel approach, which is given that I said the union movement drives a lot of this conversation, and they have picked cleaners, caretakers, security guards, retail workers, and they have got agreement from the CTU that those will be the first ones, and they've told the government they, that they want those ones to be the first ones. So I imagine they will probably be the first ones. And they are, you know, they're right throughout the, the, the economy. So at some point somewhere, those sorts of people will affect your businesses, because most of you have cleaners or caretakers or security guards or, um, or, or are associated in some way with retail. So there will be impacts right across the board if these things get off the ground. Um, that said, unlikely before the end of the year, because first of all, government has to be advised what to do, then they have to agree. That has to then be translated into drafting instructions that would then give the people that draft laws the, you know, the, 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 the right framework to draft up, and then it has to be passed through. So we're not talking 
law any time this side of Christmas, probably, uh, just in practical terms. And if we can make it slower because there's legal problems, so much of the, um, the, the, the so much the better. Right, Holidays Act, very quickly. We've always had the problems. The government agreed to a review, which has now been approved, but we won't see that law probably till the end of the year because in the last election they promised sick leave and uh, Matariki. The reason we pushed back on sick leave, the 10 days sick leave, is that we have got, um, the, the reason for asking for the 10 days, primarily again from unions, is because of COVID. Um, you know, the extra days being taken for tests and various other things are pushing people's sick leave balances quite hard. Our response is, if it's COVID related, then waiting for a law is not actually solving the problem you say exists. Let's have a COVID related solution that we can have now at a policy level, like we have with wage subsidies. The other thing is the cost, uh, as mentioned in the submission. We do a survey every uh, couple of years with Southern Cross, and it's shown us consistently that the average uptake of sick leave in New Zealand, i.e. irrespective of how much you actually give across in different places, is 4.7 days per year, nearly the, the, nearly the statutory entitlement of five days, or 95, 94% of that. That's 8 million person days a year not worked because of sick leave. So we expect that if we go to 10 days, 94% of that's another 3.7 days, add Matariki another one day, that's another 4.7 days or 8 million days lost to the economy at a time we really need productivity. So we think that the short-termism approach, uh, so the COVID related approach will deal with today's problem without loading the cost into the long-term future. And when we've got minimum wages going up as well, there's just more and more cost going in at a time when most businesses can't really confront it. Social insurance, starting on passing very, very quickly. The future of work is focused on four things, and they've decided to work on just one, just transitions, which is about what happens to large-scale uh, redundancy situations like Taranaki, oil and gas, or whatever else. The unions have always wanted a minimum entitlement to redundancy in every contract for every employee as a means of dealing with this thing. However, what you do when you get that is you load your balance sheets with the, with the liability of that redundancy, and it has a material effect on two things. It incentivizes insolvencies, as the French found when they did it, and the other thing is it changes the value of your business, which means for sale and purchase purposes, the entire value of every business is altered by the virtue of that liability, both undesirable. So what we have agreed to start work on, and the CTU has also agreed, is that if we take an analogy with ACC, ACC is a process where if you get hurt, there's a system that picks you up economically, pays you, and rehabilitates you using the health system, before Christmas, we said to Jacinda and, and Grant, we said, what about a system that if you get hurt economically, are you made redundant, large scale or not, a system that picks you up, su supports you and rehabilitates you using the education system. Instead of having redundancies on balance sheets, let's have a system that deals with that, funded through some sort of contribution, which would be arguably a lot less than ACC because there's a lot less people, lot less people likely to be affected by that than there are ACC. And they said, yep, let's talk. So they've now put together a working party. It is now the future of work's priority work, uh, and we will be working on that together with the government probably for the next couple of years. But if it happens, there will be a system that sits above the social welfare system, doesn't replace it, uh, takes some pressure off the social welfare system, and takes a lot, puts a lot more certainty into, into businesses' pockets because they know what the costs will be. Uh, and who knows what it will finally look like, but they've agreed to take that path instead of the one that we've always feared. Passing on just quickly, you know what happens with, with unions that have members, some members in an agreement, they get an agreement, then they, uh, then they pass on the results of the collective to everybody else, and the union hates that because they did the work and they don't get anything for it. They, they see fair pay agreements as if they get better, bigger coverage for the, the deal they do, they should be able to clip that ticket. And there's a huge economic incentive for, for, for unions to have that happen. And they see various ways of doing that. For instance, it could be a levy on employers covering everybody that's have covered Every one of their employees that's covered by an FPA could be a variety of things, but it's a, it, it's, a, it's a drive from unions because they see the need for economic recovery for themselves as well, and this is an opportunity. Non-standard work, the contractors. Labor has always said that it wants to do something about contractors. They see exploitation as the reason for that. They think there's a lot of exploitation of people outside the margins of employment, and they want to change that. And their way to change it is to change the rules for everybody rather than tracking down and punishing people who are doing things wrong. There was a big discussion paper last year that came out. They're still analysing that. 
But there is kind of a global context, and I mentioned that before, a global context to things like non-standard work. All of the unions in the world affiliate up to the Global Council of Trade Unions. Uh, our CTU affiliates through the International Trade Union Congress up to this. They meet in every four years in Lausanne and Switzerland, and here's their policy, first policy, primary policy, is their holy grail, is that there is no other form of work or employment than employment, permanent full-time employment. No contracting, no casuals, no. Now, they know that's not practical, but that's their holy grail. It's what that everything gets tested against that. Every bargaining process you go through that pushes back on the use of casuals or whatever else has this as its kind of um, you know, principle or creed that, that they aspire to. So this is why you see the tension where employers want flexibility because all those forms of work have a practical value and are appropriate in certain circumstances. And, I, and we argue that all of those forms should be allowed to exist. They're not non-standard. They are simply various forms of appropriate work. That's the other side of the equation, and that tension in the middle is why you sometimes see all these arguments. That's what creates the tension. We're seeing it already happening in various cases around the place. I won't dwell on those. But they're, even without law attaching to these things, unions are seeing opportunities to push back and change things. The options in that discussion paper, there were 11. Um, I've regrouped them, not the way that they did. There seem to be four approaches, either, changing, either making the rules tougher or applying the rules more toughly, uh, requiring more rules to get use the same framework but make them easier to use for the regulatory authorities, changing the rules, i.e. turning contractors into employees, or, for instance, having different models like the, like the film industry model. They're all possibilities that are inherent in that consultation document. Where the government will go, we don't know. But those are all there, and they're all in the, in the slide that you can see. And the, the submissions relating to these things are all on the Business New Zealand website if you want to read them. Just lastly, again, context. In terms of why unions drive, the, drive for the things they do, unions basically boil down everywhere in the world. They boil down to three things. They want more money, they want less pressure on their, on their people, and they want more formality. They like things tied up in contracts, preferably collective contracts. In terms of more money, it's pretty easy. They, they, they chase either an increase in the hourly rate, basically, through either through the lift in the minimum wage, chasing the living wage, pay equity claims, or just straight out wage claims. I want more money. The other side of that equation, and, and less obvious, is growing the number of hours you get paid for, even if the rate doesn't change. And things like the sleepover case, where the, 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 you remember the case, um, Idea Services, where the worker slept while at an HQ client's house and they were paid an allowance while they were asleep, and they were paid their full wage while they were working. The union took that to the court and said, sleeping is working, and the court agreed. Uh, aged care workers paid their full rate when they were in a client's house, but paid a, a travelling allowance when they were travelling between. The union said, no, travelling is working, and the court agreed. Briefing, the Smith City case, where people had to turn up before the shop opened for a briefing before they started, and the union said, that time is working, and the court agreed. Uh, the meat industry case, where workers had to take off their PPE before they went to Smoko and then put it back on again. And the union said, the court, uh, that's working, and the courts agreed. The Donning and Doffing case. Interesting thing about every one of those cases, they're all taken by the same person, a, lad, a man called Peter Cranny, who's the lawyer for the Council of Trade Unions. And he makes no bones about that they are picking off every opportunity to increase the number of hours that have to be paid. And in my mind, and he has, oh, I haven't talked to him about this, but in my mind, there's one left to come. Uh, and he's quite open about, he's told me that he's looking for the case that will give him the right to challenge standby and call out. So where you get the pager, stay at home on a Saturday and you're told you're on duty till 12, if the pager goes, you go to work, you get paid for that, and we'll give you an allowance for being available. Being available, according to Mr Cranny, is work, and he's going. He's looking for the court case to advance that. So that's the, 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 the wage game, is more for the hour and more hours. The pressure, all obvious stuff, all the kind of uh, flexible working arrangements, meal breaks, increased forms of leave, all manifesting themselves there. And formal relationships, uh, lots more coverage, preferably collective coverage, because A, that gives unions enforcement rights. And FPAs are the ultimate enforcement right because they cover the entire economy without having to have lots of members. And of course, pushing back on, full, on non full time work. So I won't go through that, we've done on that. In terms of the size of the prize, economically, 1990, 700,000 union members, right now about half that. Imagine if they could get compulsory unionism again, that's a minimum of 300,000 more people paying 
union dues as a, as a minimum. Fair pay agreements, far more than that. So economically, if you were a business, that's a prize you'd chase. So you can't blame them for chasing it. Just accept that they are driven by that. It's a huge opportunity. They won't get it forever, and they will chase it. So there you go. And that's not everything, but that's some of the major ones that's going on. I am just conscious, I know that a lot of you do need to go, but I just wanted to say very, very briefly, you can see how active uh, things are in the marketplace at the moment and the changes that are coming. You can be rest assured that we're going to be doing everything to uh, be speaking with local MPs when we're in Wellington to be talking with MPs, ministers, officials. Business New Zealand, of course, will continue to do an excellent job in that regard as well and continue to do submissions. But the most important thing for us is to get feedback from you because this is, this is what we need for Wellington to bring some reality um, to some of the officials who have never actually been out and worked in the marketplace. So if you want to stay afterwards and have a chat with any of us, please do. We would really enjoy that. If you've got any questions later on, just let us know. So it just leaves me to just thank uh, Paul and David as well. I mean, I, I hope that you've enjoyed it today. Any feedback, again, is appreciated. And I guess if we could just thank them in the usual way. And just finally, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you.